Good Friday morning from Millvale and Mr. Small's Theater. This is Geik's Got Game for another week on this June 15th, 2018. I'm your host, Matt Geika. Please be with you for the next hour or so. Who knows how long I might go here. All by myself, though, flying solo today. Uh, no guests because it's a summer smorgasbord. Or you know what? If, if spring was a smorgasbord, summer's a buffet, if you want to put it that way, if you are a sports fan. We can pick and choose and belly up to various stations. Treat it like a Las Vegas buffet, in fact. There are so many spots we can go to with your traditional team sports, joining forces with the World Cup and soccer, with the U.S. Open and golf. Coming up soon is Wimbledon for tennis and all that, too. But just this week, <clears throat> excuse me, just this weekend is outstanding. It, it's so rife with topics, and I just can't wait to dig in, much like when you do go to a, a buffet that you really enjoy. So we're going to get to that in just a little bit here on Geek Scott Game. I mentioned World Cup Soccer, U.S. Open Golf, the NHL offseason has started. Where do the Penguins stand as they try to revamp and re-gear for what should be another run at a Stanley Cup next year? It all starts now, and the most active time of the NHL offseason is, uh, is typically right around the NHL draft, which will start next weekend. So you have that. You have basketball just ending. Again, congratulations to the Golden State Warriors joining the Washington Capitals as our early summertime champions. Very well deserved, of course, for Golden State. Much more predictable, as I talked about recently, in the NBA than it is in the NHL. I wouldn't say the Caps were off the board, but yeah, definitely. They, uh, they surprise a lot of people, including myself. So there is that. There is baseball. That's the last thing I brought up here in this intro, and it's the season that is still active. Maybe that speaks to our, our current sports climate where we like to talk about things in the offseason as much as we do in season. But yes, MLB continues on too. And I have some suggestions and some thoughts for the sinking pirates in our final segment of Geek Scott Game today. So that's on tap too. That'll be later on if you want to hang on until then. If you're that eager to get into the Bucko talk, you probably aren't considering they've lost eight straight series and they have dropped from first place in the NL Central all the way down to fourth and not looking like they're going to climb out anytime soon. At least they'll have the last place team in the Central at home this weekend at PNC Park as they return back uh, after a 2-4 and four road trip. So that's all coming up. Before we get to that, though, I want to remind you that you can find me on social media. You can respond to the show. Go to Facebook, in fact, to post a comment. It's streaming on my Matt Geica media page. You can find it right there. Um, linked to all the various places at the River's Edge is out there, including its Facebook page. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Geica, M-A-T-T-G-A-J-T-K-A. Fun to be with you. As always, like I said, whether it's just me by myself or my brother, Dr. Mark Geica, talking athletic training and sports medicine two weeks ago, Alan Saunders, my colleague at Pirates Prospects, and uh, my good friend, my, uh, my compatriot here in the Pittsburgh sports scene. We both love to cover everything and talk about everything, so he's also uh, very much part of, uh, part of the scene here, regular guest at the River's Edge. So that's all coming up in just a little bit. Let's start, though, with, well, I, I mentioned it, the, the buffet, the smorgasbord that we have for us with golf and soccer and baseball, as I mentioned. Um, and when I say soccer, I mean domestic leagues in addition to the World Cup where the U.S. is not participating. It's such a different viewing experience than it used to be because we used to be privy as sports fans to the networks, to the television stations, the cable channels, we had to hang on every moment of coverage they gave us because that's all we had. There was no other way to access it. But gradually, over the past two decades, as the Internet has become more of a presence and has become the primary way many of us get our sports news, we run the show for the most part. Before this program, in fact, I got up around 7.30 a.m., ran to my laptop, the one that you see right in front of me at the moment, and switched on U.S. Open Golf. I went to usopen.com, watching the, the coverage live. And in fact, 
I have it right in front of me at the moment. I'm, I'm looking at Justin Thomas. I'm looking at Dustin Johnson. I'm looking at Tiger Woods, one of the featured groups here. You can literally follow a group around for 18 holes and, and feel like you're actually out there playing. If you're not a golf fan, maybe you don't find that too captivating. But it's such an intimate and a, and a do-it-yourself experience. It's rather wonderful, I think. Now, it's not all good, much like with the Internet. It can be a, a time waster. It can be a time suck. It can get you away from the productivity that you want to churn out in a given day, if you want to think about your life in, in such terms, and sometimes I do. You can lose a whole day, like I did yesterday, to the nonstop viewing experience, if you so choose. I'm sure I'll run into a similar issue as the World Cup gets revved up here in the next few days. Started officially yesterday with the host Russia team hosting um, Saudi Arabia, and now we have a fuller slate of matches today out there. So um, that's halfway across the world. We can get up early and watch if we want. This all wasn't possible before. It was tape delay. It was as the powers that be would have you experience it. And in some ways, it was more efficient, right? And they got to do a lot of that work. Now, some of that work, if you want to call it that, is put on our plate. We have to consider, what do we want to watch? What do we want to do? Um, how do we want to go about things? So in a lot of ways, we are the producer. We're the director. We can even choose. I'm looking at this U.S. Open golf platform where we can watch live in addition to what Fox, Fox Sports 1 and Fox proper are bringing to you on linear television. I can have a, a four box. I can look at three different groups plus featured holes plus sights and sounds of the Open. Uh, I can have it on mute. I can have it with commentary. It's, it's rather remarkable, and I think we all take it for granted because the human brain gets used to things rather quickly, but we shouldn't because this is so drastically different. And like I said, I felt like I was walking the grounds of Shinnecock Hills Country Club out in Long Island this morning, and, and part of that is the intimacy of watching on my own device. Part of that is thanks to increased production value, thanks to Fox and the USGA in the, the case of this tournament, the increased number of microphones. We can hear what the players and the caddies are saying to each other. If we're talking soccer, we can watch all this stuff live on a variety of, of channels and, and online streams. You could literally watch every match of the World Cup if you wanted to, if you had multiple screens and if you're that much of a, of a junkie. And if you are a, a sports fan in the modern era, I think it's a pretty good chance uh, that you are a diehard. It's more tailored toward the diehards, isn't it? I'm not sure that's great for selling these sports to um, the greater public, if you believe in the concept of the casual fan. I'm not sure I do as much anymore, but there are people out there who are still shopping, if you will, who are looking for something to watch. And so this is more for the diehard this way. And I guess you can still go to the traditional outlets. You can go to your ESPN.coms or your local newspaper if you still get one, or TV. I call it linear television because you can't pick and choose. Although I guess now with DVR, you can pick and choose and, and you can go back and watch it later and, and do your own thing there. So there's more work, there's more mental bandwidth involved, but if you are really into these sports, you can dive in like never before. Yes, you can waste a lot of time if you want to call it wasting. You can um, get away from the things in day-to-day -day life that you need to take care of. So it takes more discipline, and maybe some of us, myself included at times, like yesterday when I was following Tiger Woods' as every swing, and too many swings as it turned out as he shot eight over. But um, I didn't get as much accomplished as I wanted to yesterday, and all of us have these possibilities at work now. We're all locked in, whether it be on the phone, a tablet, or a, or a laptop. We can all find it when we want to. So... In some ways, it's great, but I suppose is what was it? Uh, Aristotle back in the day in ancient Greece talked about the golden mean. Maybe it was Socrates. It was one of those smart guys um, way back when who said that, uh, well, basically, too much of a good thing is still too much. So you have to ration it. You have to, well, at least if you don't have anything to do, you, you can go into, uh, you, you can overindulge in some ways, and um, it's, it's not going to affect you too much. But most of us have things to do on a day to day basis. So, uh, it, it does involve a little bit more uh, in terms of self-control. That's the only downside I can see, though, because like I said, it makes me more passionate about these sports to experience them up close like you can, like I am right now. I'm literally watching Tiger Woods lining up a putt while I'm hosting a radio show. Um, this would not have been possible, obviously, um, at least not with me being in command as, as uh, recently as, what, five years ago. So do you prefer it this way, or do you like your sports prepackaged, done by somebody else, 
so you don't have to worry about it. Let me know on social media. Let me know on Twitter or Facebook if you're watching there. Thank you for doing so. This is Guy Scott Game on the River's Edge. I'm going to step out and take a quick break, watch a little bit more golf, and be back with you to talk World Cup and the World Cup without the U.S. men's national team. What are we going to do? What are you doing? What's your strategy if you are a soccer fan? Or even if you're not, um, you might be tuning in because this coverage is going to be everywhere if you're just clicking around the dial, if you still do that sort of thing. So who do you pull for? Do you need someone to pull for? What's your perspective on it? I'll give you mine on the other side of this break on the River's Edge. Found at riversedgepgh.com and on Facebook Live. Hey there. William John III here from Wake Up on Fire Productions. I want to talk to you about Yinsfest 2018. It will be at Mr. Small's on June 30th. We love the buzz that's burning in Pittsburgh's music scene right now. And we want to put on a different type of festival. We are booking over two dozen musical performers who we don't think are receiving the media attention that we think they should. And we aren't leaving out poets, writers, artists, and local vendors to give you a real taste of the Pittsburgh underground. Yinsfest is Pittsburgh's music festival alternative, hosted at Mr. Small's entire campus, including the theater, the fun house, and the brand spanking new war room. It's been exciting to watch Mr. Small's grow. It's been thrilling to witness the new talent and musicians local businesses and writers flourish, and we want to bring it all together. Mr. Smalls, June 30th, all ages. Doors are at noon, and it goes well into the evening. Make an entire day of it. They have several full bars, they have food, they have indoor and outdoor activities. What more could you want? Come discover your new favorite band before everyone else does at Yinsfest 2018, Pittsburgh's music festival alternative. Hey, we're back inside Mr. Small's Theater. I'm Matt Geica. Uh, my wardrobe today brought to you by Fresh Factory, uh, one of the many fine T-shirt and apparel companies that have uh, put out some Pittsburgh kitschy stuff lately. I, I, I love it. I love this one. I don't miss Three River Stadium necessarily. Don't get me wrong. I like PNC Park a lot better. And Heinz Field, I could take it or leave. It's rather drab, in my opinion. They threw it together. Um, and they, they did it on the cheap. But you know what? They did it without tapping too much into, into public funds, at least compared to some other places. So we'll let it lie. But nevertheless, there's always room for nostalgia, right? That's the first place I ever saw a, a Pittsburgh sporting event was Three River Stadium, the old place there that eventually went up in smoke in the winter of 2001, I believe it was. Yeah, just before PNC Park opened. Um, right there on the North Shore. So, Fresh Factory. Also, I love the uh, the stuff that's put out there by uh, homage or homage, however you want to pronounce that word. They actually have a store, I was told by my buddy Jared Wickerham, um, and Jared's watching on the stream today, so hello to him. Uh, good loyal viewer and listener. But uh, there there is a store apparently in East Liberty for homage, homage. And uh, my good friend Zach DeLise, uh a past guest on this show, in fact, he runs... Pittsburgh Clothing Company, formerly, uh, what was it called? Centerfield Smoke, after the, uh, the the smoke that rises above the Centerfield batting eye at PNC Park due to Manny's barbecue stand back there, run by former pirate Manny Sanguin, or at least his name is on it. I know he's not technically cooking things up, or at least he hasn't been uh, recently, but it's still Manny's barbecue back there in Centerfield. That was the old name of, of Zach's website. Now it's Pittsburgh Clothing Company. And uh, he's just an outstanding graphic designer. We have so much to offer here from people who are born and raised here. Not that you need to be to appreciate Pittsburgh, but I think it helps. And I feel like I uh, appreciate and understand this this town a little bit better because I was born here. So um, support your local business is what I'm trying to say. And to uh, to try to get um, people to feed their their monies back into this community. And I know we're we're going big time, or we're trying to with. Attracting Amazon, I think it'll be overall a good thing. You have to watch out for increased gentrification and pushing people out of certain housing markets. But overall, I think it would be nice. I think it would be great. Um, But let's not let Pittsburgh lose its local charm. And I think we can all take a little bit of that responsibility on ourselves. Anyway, this is ostensibly a sports show, Geek's Got Game. But we can go off into various tangents. And when I say we, I mean me, the royal we today. I am Matt Geica, your host. Every Friday from 10 to 11 is when I'm with you. Here from uh, high atop the hill in Millvale, one of the real burgeoning communities in the uh, the general Pittsburgh area, just up the Allegheny River from downtown, just across the Allegheny 
from Lawrenceville. Yeah, Lawrenceville, they're cool, but I think Millvale is, uh, is certainly on the rise, too. Food trucks down by the river and all that to enjoy. We apologize for any issues on the stream in the first segment. Trying to get some gremlins chased out of the system here. It seems like we have things locked and loaded. I want to introduce a, a different topic, or, uh, or pardon me, a, a, a different segment, a new segment here on Guy Scott Game. And I want to call it something creative in the future, but for right now, we'll just say local headlines. And, and like I said already, the Pirates are at home this weekend. They are hosting the Cincinnati Reds at PNC Park. I suppose if you believe in that sort of thing, they could use your help down there at the ballpark. They uh, have lost eight consecutive series. And like I said, I'll get to perhaps a, a need for a bold move here as um, they are lurching their way toward the midway point of the MLB season. Not too long ago, we were talking about what a great story the Pirates overachievers, but now they're below 500. And I think many of us thought they would be somewhere around 500. Well, they're they're um, on a uh, really tough run as of late. And uh, you could definitely call it a slump. Some younger players underperforming. Some guys they thought would rise to the forefront haven't done so. So the uh, the Pirates at home this weekend. Also the Riverhounds. I call their games on ESPN Plus, but will also be on Pittsburgh CW 7 o'clock Saturday night. The Hounds host the Eastern Conference's highest scoring team, New York Red Bulls 2, the uh, affiliate of New York Red Bulls from Major League Soccer. So uh, Red Bulls 2 has always been one of the most competitive teams in USL. The Red Bulls system generally has produced a lot of talent. That should be a fun one. The Hounds are the best defensive team in the East. So that whole cliche about irresistible force against immovable object, that'll be the case. And it should be a, a fun clash of styles, I think, down at Highmark Stadium on the south side. Very affordable tickets. If you're pissed off about the Pirates, which many of you are, I'll let you know that the River Hounds are available there, and, and they're looking for your support, too. So that's all going on. No news for the Penguins besides the fact that their uh, home opener will be announced on the 20th, which I believe is next Tuesday, if I get my calendar correct. Actually, it's next Wednesday. Then the entire schedule will be released next Thursday. And then the NHL draft starts next Friday in Dallas. My colleague at Pittsburgh Hockey now, Dan Kingerski, will have coverage of that. He's been rolling out the PHN extra pieces over at our site. We are co-owners over there, along with uh, the behind-the-scenes man, Joe Steigerwald. He's been putting in the overtime to get our new PHN Extra platform up and running. But that's how you can best follow the Penguins, I think. I'm biased, but I love what we're putting out there on PittsburghHockeyNow.com. And in terms of the Steelers, you might have heard they've had their OTAs, their off-season training activities, if you don't know the acronym, and also their minicamp is going on on the south side right now. Antonio Brown spoke out and said that he feels like he's trapped um, by his own uh, social media and traditional media presence. And some of that is just unavoidable. A lot of that's unavoidable when you're a star athlete in America's most popular sport in a town like Pittsburgh that reveres its football team as it does. So that might have caught your attention. What also should have caught your attention was a report today out of Oakland that former Steelers receiver Martavis Bryant is likely to be suspended again for a failed drug test. So uh, that move, letting go Bryant uh, by Steelers GM Kevin Colbert, looking pretty smart. At the time, I thought, why would you let this guy go? It seems like he could be the, the man to compliment Brown on the other side of that formation to keep that offense vibrant. But it looks like it might have been the smart move to at least try to get something for Bryant. And uh, he was dealt for a draft pick, you might remember, a couple of months ago. So those are your local sports headlines. I want to go global, though. Geek Scott game is going global, like I mentioned with the U.S. Open, which is a global event, how I was watching that on my computer screen while talking to you guys. Yes, I can multitask a little bit. We're all going to be multitasking if we're soccer fans in the next three or four weeks because the World Cup, the uh, quadrennial football extravaganza is just underway in Russia, and we have a nice full plate today of, of matches. In fact, it was, what, uh, Uruguay against Egypt to start things very early on this morning. With regards to the World Cup, though, not quite as much buzz around here stateside because the U.S. men's national team, by their own fault, failed to qualify. Now, I was very zen about that. I was very calm about that until I watched part of yesterday's Russia-Saudi Arabia match, and I realized, wow, we're much better than Saudi Arabia, but 
uh, because Asia, because certain parts of the world have to have a certain amount of teams that qualify. Uh, Saudi Arabia makes it much uh, lower ranked in the FIFA World Rankings than the U.S., and then I became very bitter once I realized that uh, the U.S. would have put up a better fight in that match and many more matches that I think you'll see from uh, from some of these lower-ranked teams that made it. But neither here nor there, uh, like I said, the U.S., all they had to do was tie Trinidad and Tobago last fall, and they couldn't even do that to make the World Cup. They lost at home to Honduras and, and I forget who else in CONCACAF qualifying. So, again, I'm trying to be zen about it. It, uh, it definitely hurt yesterday. But the U.S. not being in the World Cup for the first time since the, the late 80s, since 1986. I was one year old the last time the U.S. missed the World Cup. So this is different, right? And even though they've never advanced beyond the round of 16, um, or, pardon me, they made it to the quarterfinal in 2002. But for the most part, they've been an ancillary character in the World Cup. But they have been an easy entry point for uh, those of us who, well, in my younger years, I was just getting into international soccer, now more of a full-fledged fan. Um, we're all finding teams to align ourselves with this time around. I'll put it that way, because we don't have that easy latch on, that easy buy-in with the U.S. men's national team. Personally, I'm behind the high-scoring outfit from Poland, or at least they should be able to score quite a bit. They led European qualifying in goals per match. I'm uh, of Polish heritage. You probably heard me talk about that on this show. The ancestral pride is hardcore bred into me, and I thank my mom and dad and my family. My cousin Jeff was a big influence in that, too. Um, I have several shirts referencing my, my Polish heritage. I know, me in a T-shirt. Who could imagine that? But uh, that, that's a big part of, of who I am. And if you're from Pittsburgh, we're still proud of our ethnicity. Uh, we're proud Pittsburghers, but for most of us, it's been a, it was a melting pot two, three, four generations ago, and a lot of us have held on to that through food and culture and uh, part of the, uh, the aspects of Pittsburgh that I like um, is that we hang on to our old nationalities from the old country. And so Poland's the team that's easy for me to, to follow here, and I will be doing that. But you know what? I find myself thinking it might be better without the U.S. national team to ride or die with than Maybe that's just Stockholm Syndrome and me uh, adjusting to my current situation and saying, all right, this is fine. I'm going to make the best of it. I'm a natural optimist in that way in most situations. Um, but that's what I've been debating since the U.S. men missed out on this thing back in the fall. On one hand, it is easier, like I said, to get emotionally invested with a team to back, with a team that represents your country. I was just wearing my uh, U.S. men's uh, national team t-shirt jersey the other day to get into the World Cup spirit. Then I got a little bit sad knowing that I wouldn't have them to pull for. But uh, you know what? On the other hand, we might be forced to learn more about the international soccer scene. I know I have in researching the, uh, the teams that are involved this year. And we might be forced to, heaven forbid, learn more about the world in general and people from other nations and, and uh, get more intimately familiar. So in a world, uh, well, in a time in our country where... So many people um, from the world of politics, our elected officials, I'm not going to name names, but you know who they are, are, are trying to make us more insular and more isolationist. I've always believed that we are a global community and we need to reach out. The Internet has made it that way. Uh, global forces in the, uh, the economic realm have made it that way. If we're going to bury our heads in the sand, that's one thing, but I don't think we can afford to do that. So... For me, an event like the World Cup, or that's why I like individual sports too, because I'm not just pulling for Americans. Yes, it does help um, when they're from nearby where you live or they represent your country. Uh, but I think it's healthy to, to, uh, to fall in love with players and teams from other places in the world and understand how different cultures operate. It can only make us better people, in my opinion. And Lord knows in the World Cup this year, folks, there are plenty of stories. Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, the best players in the world. They've passed that designation back and forth over the past decade. Both of them might be playing in their final World Cups. Ronaldo, of course, with Portugal. Messi with Argentina. Maybe Messi more of a contender. And Argentina's always um, underachieved at the World Cup stage. Portugal, they've been more of a, uh, of a one-man outfit or... Uh, Definitely led by their superstar striker, Cristiano Ronaldo. But to see those two in their early 30s, see what they can grind out, that's kind of over the hill in soccer. Depresses me to say as a 33-year-old, but it's true. So I'll be watching that very closely. I talked about Egypt playing this morning um, with their big-time striker, Mo Salah, of uh, English Premier League fame, of Liverpool fame. He's going to try to lead them in their first World Cup since 1990. 
So that makes me grateful already for being from the U.S. because uh, we've taken it for granted that we were going to make the World Cup and perhaps to our detriment at the national team level. But Egypt is in it. They might have a shot. They're interesting. They're promising. They're coming off a cultural revolution of a few years ago. They've restructured that country. So that's all backdrop. It's all prologue. How about the nation of Iceland, the tiny nation of Iceland? Stars of Euro 2016, they beat mighty England. Well, they used to be mighty. Now England is more of a middle-of-the-pack team. But you get the picture. Iceland has surprised. They've generated um, all this success from not a lot of, uh, of manpower on that island. And um, I'd love to get up there one of these days. There are cheap flights, by the way, from Pittsburgh on WOW Airlines to Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland. Um, I read an interesting Sports Illustrated story about how they feel like they're tight-knit community has been an advantage for them because they're all able to be a lot more cohesive than larger countries like, well, for instance, ours. Um, in this case, with all these rival factions in, in terms of youth development. So Egypt and Iceland, they're frisky underdogs if you're into that sort of thing. If you're into the traditional powers, Brazil and Germany, Germany the defending champ, Brazil the host four years ago, uh, they're back in their usual places. They should be right up there through into the knockout round. Spain, the champion from 2010, retooling on the fly, adding some new young talent to uh, some older players, Andres Iniesta among them. France is interesting again. And if you really are a member of Uncle Sam's army, if that is such a, a dyed-in-the-wool aspect of who you are as a soccer fan, there's always rooting against Mexico, right? We don't like the, the Mexican national team. At least you shouldn't if you are a, an American soccer fan. And if you're not of dual heritage, of course, that complicates things. And we have many people like that here in this country. But uh, the, the rival Mexicans are in it, and we are not. So that should be enough to get us fired up. Um, and like I said, it's not that simple, even in that case. There are more fans of L3, the Mexican national team, in America than there are in actual Mexico because of all the folks who have dual heritage and who have that, that background in places south and west. I know that's hard for us to believe in a city that is almost completely devoid of Hispanic culture, but cheering for both the U.S. and Mexico, that does happen. Um, th th that does occur <laughs> uh, out there in the world, not close to here, but in places like California and, and, and Texas especially. So my question for you is, are you pulling for anyone? Are you just letting the World Cup wash over you? Or are you simply hating on the event? Because A, you don't like soccer, or B, you were disgusted by the host nation Russia and its awful record on human rights and its possible meddling in our presidential election too? Or do you just dislike Russia because you're still buying into the old Cold War beliefs that uh, there are chief rivals in the world? I'm not going to argue against that. Pulling against the Russians is an American tradition anyway. And uh, our finest victory, you could argue, as a sporting nation, is beating the USSR team in the Miracle on Ice in 1980. So that's all baked in. A little more complicated here in Pittsburgh as we've cheered for Russian hockey players like Yevgeny Malkin currently and Alexei Kovalev of the past. But um, so there's all these conflicting things. It makes it more interesting, right? Uh, I think it does for me. And that's why I'm excited about the World Cup being back around. Um, uh, despite the complicating factors, number one, having no Stars and Stripes team to, to really pull for. So we will survive. We will persevere. And uh, I bet it'll still be uh, as wildly enjoyable as it usually is. The World Cup, there are no higher stakes in international soccer. And we could argue there are no higher stakes in international sport overall. So it's going on. The Fox Family of Network is where, Fox Family of Networks is where you can find it. Pardon me. And like I was talking about with the U.S. Open, you can tailor your watching experience. You can find it um, on various online streams. Uh, it, it's all out there for you. So I talked about the smorgasbord, the buffet. Uh, this might be um, that to the extreme here in this case. This is Geik's Got Game on the River's Edge. You can find us at riversedgepgh.com. We've gotten the audio stream locked and loaded. We're on Facebook Live as well on my page, Matt Geica Media primarily. On the other side of this break, I'll talk to you about a bold move, I think, that might be necessary for the Pirates to, uh, to find themselves competitively in the larger scheme in Major League Baseball. Talk to you in just a little bit. Hey, folks, it's Mike Sasson of The Mike Sasson Show. Me and Alex, my producer extraordinaire, looked at the landscape of Internet radio and figured if we want to make it, we've got to work. 
at least an hour earlier. Now on at 9 a.m. every Tuesday on the River's Edge, a new kind of radio. Okay, we've been rather global on Geek Scott Game, and, and thank you for watching and or listening on the uh, the audio stream on the Facebook Live feed. Good times to be with you again here at the, uh, the Mr. Smalls Theater Studios, the home of the River's Edge for the past year or so. I'm your host, Matt Geica. This is my show, Geek Scott Game. And we have been, um, uh, like I said, rolling all over the, the planet here with World Cup talk, with uh, discussion of... Um, uh, international competition in regards to the U.S. Open in particular, um, French Open, Wimbledon, it's that time of the year too. The sports uh, fan buffet has uh, been loaded up big time in 2018, and uh, I'm just loving it, even though, as I have discussed with you, at times it can, uh, <laughs> it can distract me from what I'm trying to do. One of the things I'm trying to do is uh, prepare for tomorrow's soccer match on the, on the south side, um, Pittsburgh Riverhounds. Just one loss in league play so far through about a couple of months of, of uh, USL action. They're hosting New York Red Bulls 2. Um, that's 7 o'clock tomorrow night. If you can't watch it on Pittsburgh's CW, that's a television station, and, uh, and also on ESPN+. Plus. If you can't watch it on those two, um, if you can't access it that way, we'd love to have you down there at the stadium. And, um, yeah, I'm unabashedly... Going to show for the Hounds. I, I work for them. I work for them on the broadcast side. It's my third year doing this, and I love it. It's um, it, it's been spectacular to be able to to call matches for a Pittsburgh-based pro team. And um, some might put that down. Some might say, "Ah, oh, they're just a minor league outfit." Well, you know what? Um, I think the the Hounds are a, a lot closer in esteem to the level of the Pirates these days. I feel that the Pirates have fallen to uh, minor league status for many people out there. I've talked to so many former Pirates fans, or at least they're on hiatus right now, who said they just couldn't get into it. They can't, um, they can't follow a team that has ownership like this, that uh, refuses to go beyond its comfort zone in terms of financial um, expenditures, who uh, does not operate terribly aggressively. We can put it that way. Uh, maybe that's an understatement, but that has been the case with this, uh, the baseball operations regime led by Neil Huntington, the GM, and Frank Coonley, the, uh, the president. So um, I understand those concerns. And for me, I wrote about this for Pirates Prospects. And it, the, in fact, the column just posted uh, on the website a moment ago. But um, when I look back to 10 years ago, the Pirates had a very similar team, in fact. They gave up a lot of runs, but they also scored a lot of runs. That's been the case so far this year. I suppose it was more of, a, uh, of an older, more veteran bunch 10 years ago in 2008 when it was Neil Huntington's first season in charge, and uh, he was trying to replenish the farm system, uh, attempting to make this, this organization more modern, to, um, to make it more lean, uh, just in terms of, uh, of expenditures panning out and, and becoming productive, um, players not being overpaid, but, uh, but being properly uh, weighted um, as far as youth versus veterans. So um, all of that was in the process, and we knew at the time that Major League Baseball was an inherently unfair system. Uh, but I, I wondered on Pirates prospects, and I'm not sure if I know the answer, is this team really better off 10 years later Yes, they made the playoffs three years in a row, but they're looking at three years in a row out of it if this current trend continues in 2018. And uh, we're looking again at another trade deadline period where the Pirates would probably be better off selling off some of their veterans and trying to build for 2019 and beyond. I know no one wants to hear that, but that's where we are right now. And um, as I wrote this week for Pittsburgh Soccer Now, where I have a weekly column as well, the Riverhounds have a real chance to grab the hearts and minds of those who might typically latch on to the Pirates in the summer. And the fact that we're even discussing it, and you may disagree with me, I may be um, portraying a, a pipe dream here, but the fact that we're even discussing it is abysmal for a Pittsburgh baseball club and a fan base that has roots going back to the 1800s. And maybe I'm getting a little carried away here, but with the combination of perception, the team doesn't want to win, and reality, the team is not winning currently, the Pirates are on the verge of, of falling below uh, the University of Pittsburgh, of, of falling below the Pittsburgh Riverhounds, at least at some point in the future, if they continue on like this. And I don't think it's that far-fetched to question the, the viability of this franchise 
once the PNC Park lease runs out, um, which will come in about, what, 10 more years, I think. I believe there was a 30-year lease for PNC Park when it opened in, in 2001. What's to say that uh, the ownership at that point, whether it's led by Bob Nutting and his family or not, what's to say that they look at this market and how it has completely atrophied for baseball and say, we can find greener pastures elsewhere, we can move the Pirates somewhere else. PNC Park was supposed to save us from that, but with the way this team has been operated and with the way that fans have turned away from it, uh, rightly or wrongly, I think that's in the picture too. And those who hadn't already checked out or at least thinking about it right now with how this season has gone, there will be diehards always, and I love baseball. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll be following the Pirates until the day I die, but you need more than people like me. You need more than diehard fans. And what I'm left wondering right now uh, forgetting all the big picture stuff for the, the Pirates and their place in the Pittsburgh sporting hierarchy. What I'm left wondering right now is if the Pirates need more bold moves beyond just shopping the marketable veterans, like we're going to hear about in the coming months, like John Paul Morosi of Fox Sports just reported, your Jordy Mercers, your Josh Harrisons, your Yvonne Novas, your Francisco Cervelli's even, even though he's under contract for another year, much like Harrison, your Corey Dickerson's, even though he could be retained um, automatically next year just by taking him to arbitration or uh, refreshing his one-year deal at a cheap rate. These people could all be traded, and it would be the predictable, it would be the safe move for a team that's out of it. Or if you're like me, maybe you feel like this team is in a rut, and they need to move a foundational piece, or people who were considered foundational pieces in the past, people like Gregory Polanco, who doesn't look like he's figuring it out anytime soon. Maybe Josh Bell isn't what we thought he was going to be. This second full season in the majors, third season really, as he played much of 2016 with the big club, this season has not been um, anything close to a progress. Uh, He looks like he's going backwards, in fact. Maybe it's coaching. Some of it's on the player, though. Perhaps some of it is just the true talent coming out and how he's going to perform long-term in the majors. Do the Pirates need to trade a player like a Polanco or a Bell to uh, replenish the farm system, to get some new talent in there, maybe make a major league for major league trade, heaven forbid, an old challenge trade um, in order to to get this team where it could be. How about Starling Marte? I know he's arguably their most consistent performer, or he has been this year, but with the Pirates where they are, I think still bereft of enough pitching talent to compete long-term in the National League Central and in the National League at large, maybe that's the move. Now, this offense has been above average for the most part uh, at most lineup spots. And that's why I bring up 2008, as I referenced in my Pirates Prospects column this week. Um, that team hit pretty well, hit very well in some circumstances, but it couldn't keep runs off the board. We're seeing that again this year. And sometimes when you're halfway there, you're almost further away than, than when you're completely rebuilding because the, the two cycles, the, the two sides of a team in baseball, and you can compare this to football, too, with offense and defense. And you can compare it, in fact, to the Steelers with uh, how their defense has let them down in recent years. But um, in baseball, it's the same case, or maybe even more so the case, where you have to get at least some alignment of the run prevention and the run production. And uh, right now, with uh, the way the rotation is performed, with the way the bullpen is disappointed, Felipe Vasquez doesn't look like to be anywhere near a a sure thing after the Pirates extended him in the offseason. Michael Feliz has struggled mightily. That's your two most important guys, the guys pitching the most high leverage innings, and they aren't performing either. So you're giving away wins there too. And boy, does that ever remind of how good the Pirates had it with Mark Melanson and Tony Watson clicking and Jared Hughes when he was at his best. That was such a massive part of those 2013 through 15 playoff teams was holding on to victories when you had them in your grasp. Um, whether it be starting pitching, not giving them enough of a foundation or relief, not holding on to things, not keeping games winnable. It's been a a very disturbing last three to four weeks for the Pirates in that regard. And not that this past stretch, this slump is more representative of who they are than their first six or seven weeks in which they were a very competitive team. But this team still doesn't feel like uh, a team that uh, is going to be challenging for playoff berths consistently in the future. So, I think it's time for a bold move, or at least to consider that. If teams are going after a Starling Marte, I wouldn't have said this even as of a month ago, but if teams are sniffing around Jamison Tyone, your former presumed um, number one pitcher after Garrett Cole was traded, 
I think you have to think about it. You have to think about a lot of things if you're Neil Huntington because right now this team is treading water and 10 years into your regime when you probably should have had a better foundation by now. Um, maybe you, you start to trust the, the younger players more. You throw Austin Meadows out there. You call up Nick Kingham. You call up Kevin Newman, and you just say, all right, it's time for the young players to go at it. And uh, perhaps it's a blessing, in fact, that the, the Pirates have turned down in recent weeks because that can give them an excuse to do just that and, like I said, maybe go outside their comfort zone for once and, uh, and deal one of these players for a bigger haul because they are under club control for longer term, because they are younger, because they, at least in theory, have promise. These are all things that I believe the Pirates should be thinking about right now um, as opposed to their usual procedure of uh, kind of going halfway and um, uh, trying to be both buyers and sellers. Maybe if you're a Pirates fan, you should be rooting for this team to continue to lose because that would at least give them some consistent direction and um, allow this team to turn itself over in a way that would be productive in the future. Because 2018, let's face it, fourth place in the Central, really competitive division, pretty competitive uh, NL at the top. I don't think it's going to happen this year. So um, let's look ahead. That's at least my view on the situation. We'll take one final break here on Geek Scott Game and uh, bring it back for a quick look at the NHL. It was a dark week in the NHL, and uh, I hated for it to be that way because I wanted to talk more about the Stanley Cup Final. Of course, other events have pushed that out. We're already jam-packed in this hour. But um, there was one topic that was more important from a, a holistic point of view, from a, a personal point point of view than anything I could talk about relating to on-ice competitiveness and what's going to happen in the offseason and all that fun stuff that we'll have plenty of time to discuss as the summer rolls on. So that's up next as we head into overtime on Geek Scott Game. Keep it right here. You didn't wash your hands! People who do not wash their hands should be fined. And I'm sorry, I don't know about all of you, but if you're going to castrate me, you might as well just kill me! So enjoy your hot dog, you jackass! Get educated with Brian Crawford live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. here on the River's Edge. Just a short overtime to wrap up the show. This is Geik's Got Game. My name is Matt Geitka. I'm very pleased and honored to be with you, as I am every Friday, or most every Friday. I've been on a nice streak here, being able to show up and turn up and be here <laughs> um, in present, uh, or totally present, in uh, the River's Edge studios. This has been enjoyable to me to be part of the network here and uh, enjoyable to work alongside Tyler Zelenko, my producer um, and engineer for the show. Thanks again to Brian Crawford for continuing to put up with my nonsense here once a week. And um, it's been three years. It'll be three years, in fact, in just a couple of weeks. So we'll have to have some sort of a celebration there, a three-year anniversary show of some sort, bring in a few guests. Today, it's been just me. Sometimes I like these shows the best, even though I do love to get other viewpoints, but um, at times I just have so much to say after a, a, about a week of buildup that um, I, I just uh, need the microphone all to myself. I can be a little selfish like that. I can be a Mike Hogg in some ways. I suppose all of us in the business can be like that at times. Again, you can find me on social media if you've been watching on Facebook. Thank you again for that. It's on Matt Geica Media. I am on Twitter at Matt Geica as well. I have a love-hate relationship with a platform like many people. Um, sometimes it can be distracting. Other times it can be really engaging. And uh, I hope that it can be that way for you. If you do follow me, I try to keep it positive for the most part. Not one of those people who wants to complain about everything. And um, yeah, I want to speak out against things that bother me. But I don't want to bog you down and, and make it uh, a dark experience for everyone who clicks follow there. But I couldn't help it this week, and that's what I want to finish today's show with. I, I spoke on this for my 200-foot podcast on the Pittsburgh Hockey Now podcast network, and you can go check out that audio content over there if you have more time for it. About 20 minutes of discussion about the NHL and its halting progress, but I think progress nonetheless toward protecting players and their brains especially, whether it be in the present when they're in the league or uh, after that, their post-playing career. You have to remember, these players have families leaning on them, too. So you're not just talking about player health. You're talking about family viability, um, uh, capability to lead somewhat decent lives. Uh, I know that these players make a lot of money, and that reduces the empathy factor for many of you out there. 
Heck, it reduces the empathy factor for me because I literally cannot relate to having that much scratch on hand. But um, I know that health is everything. I know that depending on or regardless of whether I've had a job or I haven't had a job or where I've been financially, if, if I'm feeling good, if I'm feeling like myself, if I, I feel um, healthy, then it's all gravy from there. That's always been my perspective. And I'm gathering that I'm not alone. That's why it's been so heartbreaking to see stories of former NHL players, well, those who are still with us, but uh, guys who have have fought through post-concussion symptoms, who have fought through uh, apparent brain trauma and the resulting psychological effects caused by playing such a violent sport. Yes, I know they understood the, the risks, but I also don't think the NHL did as good of a job as it could have in protecting players and just being cautious. Why can't we be cautious? Gary Bettman keeps talking about, well, there's no certain link between concussions and playing hockey and developing CTE and all these other uh, mental problems down the line, Um, problems with the brain and how the body functions as a result. Well, no, there's no 100% certain link, but the probabilities are certainly there. And wouldn't you want to reach out and protect those guys who put their butts and their brains on the line on a, on a nightly basis for you, 80 plus times a year, um, don't you feel that obligation as a fellow human being? And I don't know if that's how the NHL leaders are being uh, told to behave in these on the record situations by their lawyers because they don't want to admit to any kind of culpability. And I suppose I can understand that from a logical point of view, but even going back In the day, the the tough man, the macho hockey culture, the play through it hockey culture, it's caused so much damage. So I think we need to go above and beyond in the other direction. Be overly cautious. Um, Some might not like that, but I believe that is the right way to go about it. So that's that's my feeling on it. You have to have reparations when you uh, commit a wrong, when you push these players into action when they shouldn't have been pushed, um, like your Daniel Carcillos or your Nick Boyton's. Nick Boyton, a, a former NHL defenseman. Had a, had a fantastically um, descriptive post, even though the, the story um, in and of itself was sad. But he had a great post on the Players' Tribune um, uh, about all the things he's been dealing with and, and how he felt like he was mistreated when he tried to talk about this when he was in the industry, when, his, when he was playing hockey and uh, experiences of blacking out when uh, he was playing after he took a hit in a certain game. He wouldn't remember finishing the game, even though he played several shifts afterward. That's scary stuff, and it hasn't gotten any better. He's depressed, um, uh, whether that be an effect, a direct effect of the head hits or not. Um, uh, these players need to be taken care of because they gave us so much enjoyment, right? It's the least we could do as a hockey culture, as a hockey-following nation, if you will. And it's definitely the least they could do as, as leadership. So while I believe that um, the NHL has made changes to its rule book, changes to its culture just organically from players coming up, focus more on speed and skill. That's to hockey's credit. That's to the NHL's credit. And I want to give them credit for that. Um, But I don't want to give too much credit because there's still so far to go. And uh, this may happen just naturally with the sport evolving to where it is um, compared to where it was 10 or 15 years ago. There's much less headhunting, your Tom Wilson's aside. But uh, there are fewer suspensions I think because primarily because there are fewer um, hits that are warranting of suspension. So don't just look at the raw numbers. Watch the game. I think if you have watched the game for 20-plus years like I have, or even for 10-plus years, you can see the difference. You can see less hits in general, maybe to the chagrin of some. You can see much fewer fights. We know those numbers have gone down. Um, For me, I'd eliminate fighting. I'd make it a no-tolerance policy on checks to the head. Just to make it as safe as possible. This game is never going to be completely safe. But with the evidence that we do have, we need to give the the players the benefit of the doubt um, uh, on these possible links between playing hockey and um, deleterious effects to their lives down the line. And we need to protect the players and the sport from itself. And that's where the logical mind, the higher level reasoning processes have to come into play here, not just the primal feelings that we have when we cheer on a big hit and all of that. We have to balance it out or else we're not human beings. We're just animals. So I, I talked further on this subject on Pittsburgh Hockey Now, so you can find it there. But I wanted to wrap up the show with my thoughts on that. And, and with the week that was with... Uh, depositions coming out, reporting from Canadian outlet TSN and their reporter Rick Westhead, who's done a wonderful job there, exposing these dark 
things to, to the sunlight and, and uh, letting us know just how far behind the times NHL leaders used to be and still are in admitting uh, links here. Heck, the NFL has even done it. And I know they may have more money to sustain a class action lawsuit from their players than the NHL does, but it's still the right thing to do to admit that there are ways that you can get better and there are ways in which you screwed up, quite frankly. So um, with personal um, stories like Dan Carcillo, like Nick Boynton that are being exposed, that are being, um, well, first of all, um, allowed to, to see the light of day by these players themselves, what courage they've had to go against the prevailing hockey culture and to go against the type of people out there who would say, oh, how are they complaining? They have millions of dollars in the bank. Well, screw that. If you can't think properly, if you can't act properly, if you can't be yourself, all the money in the world isn't going to help you. So um, we should all be at least able to agree on that much. Thanks again for listening to Geik Scott Game, for watching Geik Scott Game, brought to you by the River's Edge. We're on Facebook Live, but the audio stream is our bread and butter, local music, local talk. I'm so happy to be a part of that. And I hope to talk to you again at this time next week, Lord willing. This is Matt reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. For Tyler, for Brian, for all of us here at the River's Edge, have a fantastic weekend.